Okay, here we go. Hello, Hello everyone, everyone, and, and welcome, welcome to our latest Stata.net webinar, Windows 11 for Developers. Today, Today we're going to focus exclusively on the latest details surrounding Windows 11 and how it impacts you as a developer. My name is Jim Duffy. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Code. I was a developer and training instructor back in the day, but I've been lured to the dark side, and now I'm responsible for the marketing and sales efforts for all of our code services, including Code Magazine, of course. But Code is so much more than just a magazine. Yes, Code Magazine is our flagship and probably how you know about us, but there are other divisions as well, including Code Consulting, where we do custom software development work, Code Training and Mentoring, and Code Staffing. Our continuing mission is to help people build better software. We're a Microsoft partner and provide a number of services, including building custom software solutions on-prem and in the cloud, modernizing legacy applications, educating developers, providing developer resources to augment your development team, and supporting and maintaining existing applications. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help with your next project. Our very popular and in-demand free hour of code provides an opportunity for you and or your team to meet with our hand-picked experts to discuss anything you could use our help with. Slots are limited, so reach out to me today about getting your free hour of code scheduled for you and your team. No charge, no strings, no commitment, just free help from our code experts. Are you a React developer looking for a new gig? Or do you know one? Come join the code consulting team. We have multiple junior and senior React positions currently open. Full-time and contractor positions are available. Follow the link for more information. Are you looking for a new gig? Check out our jobs page for our open positions. Are you interested in writing for Code Magazine? Follow the link for more information. Are you looking to add team members to your development team? Our Code Staffing Division can help you find the development talent you're looking for. If you like what you see today or have seen, have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Code Magazine is the leading software development magazine written by expert developers for developers. As a benefit for attending today, all registered attendees who don't already subscribe will automatically receive a free digital Code Magazine subscription. I've also included a free subscription link for you to freely share with others who couldn't make it to the webinar today. We would like your feedback about the webinar in the form of a quick survey, and we're willing to pay a hundred bucks in the form of an Amazon e-card to one lucky attendee. A name will be drawn from the entire webinar's registered attendee list, and a completed survey is required to qualify for the e-card. If the selected name hasn't filled out a survey, another name is selected and so on. You don't want to be that person whose name is selected only to lose out because you failed to complete the survey, right? The survey is very short and you'll finish it in no time flat. The survey link is on the slides and we'll post the survey, post the survey link in the chat window as well. The slides and recording of today's webinar and all of our past webinars are available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link here. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Marcus is the big kahuna around here. He's code president and chief software architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft regional director, excellent golfer, and all around nice guy. If this is your first time attending one of our webinars, welcome and thank you so much for attending. If you've attended one of our webinars in the past, welcome back. Okay, you've heard enough from me. Thanks for listening. Take it away, Marcus. Thank you, Jim. Hello and welcome everyone, uh, wherever you might be. Uh, I see we have a good turnout again. So people from all over the world again, uh, as seems to have been the case the last few Stata.nets we've done, uh, we are ourselves all over the world. I'm actually in Taos, New Mexico today, visiting with uh, the CEO of EPS who lives here. And I wish I could just turn the camera around and show you out the window. The, Birds are chirping, you might hear them, in the back, hear them in the background. The scenery is unbelievable. Um, unfortunately, with the studio setup we have, I can't just do that. But uh, it's a, a rather nice place to be. So we have a little bit of an improvised setup here today. Uh, so if the sound is not quite as perfect as it normally is, I uh, hope, you, hope you'll overlook that. But I, I think we got it set up pretty well. So. Windows 11, we got a lot to talk about here today. Uh, let me just dive right into my slide deck here uh, and actually go to the agenda. The agenda is gonna be pretty easy today. Uh, we're gonna take a quick lap around Windows 11. We're gonna talk about some of the news that are in there. And 
do. So let's try to get back to the slides here. Something seems to be interfering. There we go. Um, so we'll talk about Windows 11 in general and what's new in there and, and why do you care. And then we'll also talk about what is new for developers and, and how do you develop for it? Should you develop for it? How will your current apps work in Windows 11? So a lot of those kinds of things. Now, some of it is pretty early days still. I have Windows 11 installed on this machine that I'm using for the presentation here today, which is actually my main developer machine or one of my two main developer machines at this point. Uh, so it is stable enough to do that, but it's still a preview version, right? So be aware of that. There's a few things. I experience some slowdowns every now and then, for instance, when I go into File Explorer, little things like that as are to be expected with a fairly major new release. But all things considered, it's actually pretty stable. And, and so that's one piece of information for you that I can give you right away uh, is, is that that is the case. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, what is Windows 11? Well, it's the next version of Windows, right? You probably didn't need to come to this event to understand that. Now let's make sure we don't have a problem with the audio here. Just one moment. Yeah, it should be working. Um, Let's get this going here. Uh, so it's the next version of Windows. And in a lot of ways, it's actually not that big a deal. Uh, this used to be known as Windows 10, the second half of 2021 release. So that's the assumption we were under maybe up to six months ago, is that this was just going to be another big Windows 10 release, like Microsoft had been doing every, every six months or so. Uh, now, we knew it was going to be a fairly big release because it was going to have a, a UI refresh and a bunch of new things in it. So we knew this wasn't going to be small. But whether this really is a Windows 11 release that's a major, major new version of Windows or whether it's a Windows 10 H2 release, that's probably more of a marketing thing, I would say, right? So, so in that sense, uh, a lot of people ask me, should I install Windows 11? Yes or no? Is it too early? Well, if you think of it as a Windows 10 H2 release, you might be, well, that's not that big a deal, right? So in a way, don't expect huge, huge changes. But if you approach it as a, as a Windows 10 new release, then it is surprising how big the changes are. So we are somewhere in between is what I'm saying, somewhere between a truly major new release and, uh, and and just another upgrade to Windows 10. Now, Microsoft in the past used to say Windows 10 was going to be it. There was never going to be a new version and, and it's just going to be updates to Windows 10, kind of like Apple is doing with the Mac OS. Whether you believe that, I was a little bit dubious at the time uh, because, of course, marketing interferes and... At some point, you need something new. And so not too surprising that that is what happened here. Um, so when is this going to be available? It's actually available to you right now if you're joining the Windows Insider program and you're going into the Dev channel. And then it'll just install as a Windows Insider build. You could even roll back if you want. And so again, it's not super high risk to do that. The final release is expected October 20th of 2021. So it's not that far off either, but still a few months away. Now, in terms of the big news, the one thing that people notice is that the UI has gotten a bit of a refresh. Now, it's not to a point where you just won't recognize it anymore, but it's definitely a little bit different. And it's one of those things where when you first go into it, uh, you're like, well, this is a little different. This is a little different. It's not that big a deal. And then when you go back to Windows 10, you're like, oh, man, that looks old now. So I had this experience where I took this machine that I'm on right now, which is my major dev machine, and I upgraded it to Windows 11. And, and I kind of had this experience of, yeah, kind of nice and I like it, and uh, but not that big a deal. And then I got another new machine. I'm just in the process of migrating over to a brand new machine because this computer is getting a little old. And I had Windows 10 installed in that machine. And, and I had this experience of, oh, my God, this just looks old. So my original plan was to keep that on Windows 10 and go with the stable release version. But then I just, in a way, it felt so old that I ended up upgrading it to Windows 11 pretty much right away, too. And, and that's kind of an, an eye-opening experience to me because 
it does look a lot more polished in my mind. Uh, Windows 11 is just this comfort, uh, comfortable version of Windows that's meant to make everyone feel at home. And, and we'll go through the UI here in just a moment and you'll be like, what is he talking about? It's not that big a difference, but when you use it for a while, it actually is. And there were some interesting things that we already had happened. For instance, we have some people within our organization as well as, as outside that are using Macs and they gave Windows 11 a chance and a number of them actually said, wow, this actually is a nice OS. I can see myself looking, uh, using that. And to me, that's a very interesting thing. It's this degree of polish that I feel the operating system now has that will draw people into Windows 11. And as a developer developing for Windows 11, that is super important. Now, is it so important that the buttons and the windows have rounded corners? Well, it doesn't make that huge a difference to me. And, and it certainly isn't a feature that you're going to be selling as, oh my God, you got to have this because you can't live without rounded corners. But it is significant that people enjoy using this and are drawn to the product because to me, as somebody who's developing for this product, I of course need that market to be well established and, and like the product and flock to it. So that's kind of the most obvious difference is in the UI, but there's actually quite a bit more. And some of them, are, some of those things are pretty substantial. Like we'll talk about the new Windows Store, which to me is huge news. We'll talk about things like subsystems within Windows, like the Linux subsystem that has had some major improvements. So there are quite a number of things that have been improved under the hood that are uh, really important. Now, before we actually go into looking at the UI, um, I want to point out one more thing. If you have any questions, this is a live event, right? This is not pre-recorded or anything. So if you have any questions, put them into the chat window. I'm going to be looking over here every now and then where my people will feed me the questions uh, unless they can answer them directly. So I'll be looking over here. I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. We'll keep some towards the end of the event when we have a Q&A session. So anyway, let's take a look at the... Uh, I can get my slide to move forward. Let's take a look at the UI. Uh, and I'm going to go out of my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to minimize a lot of those things and just show you the new desktop and what it's like. Now, again, this is not so different that you won't recognize what's going on. It's obviously still Windows. Now, there are a few things here that will jump out at you. One of them, and this has gotten a lot of talk, is the taskbar is now in the middle. So instead of the start button, which is here, being over to the left side, it's moved to the middle. And the icons are all in the middle and they're kind of just centered as long as they have space and then they start moving over a little bit to one side. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like that. I want my start button in the bottom left side of the screen. And that's fine. You can go into your taskbar settings, which launches uh, the settings UI. And in here, you can make changes, of course, and you can define where you want your taskbar to go, where, uh, you know, how the overflow behavior works and, and so on and so on and so on. All right. So I could go and move my taskbar to the left and you see, boom, it animates over to the side and you got your old taskbar back. So, you know, you'll hear a lot about that. If that bugs you, just move it back to the left. Now, when I started using this, I was like, well, I'll leave it in the middle because I should be open-minded. I need to learn new things. I need to talk to people about it. I'll, I'll leave it in the middle and I see how much I like it. It turns out I actually like it quite a bit. Uh, I have a fairly big monitor. Um, people would say it's huge. I have this 40-inch display. And you sit in the middle of that display and, and the taskbar is way over to the left. And I discovered I actually like it better when it's in, when it's in the middle. But if you don't, just move it back to the left. The one thing that bugs me a little bit is it's not the task icon so much, but it's the actual start bar. Like that's the one thing where I still go back and I just fling my mouse over to the left bottom and you can't miss it, right? It's uh, what in UI uh, development methodology is often referred to as the mile high menu. You can fling your mouse to the left and it, it hits the side of the screen and the bottom of the screen and you can keep going and keep going and keep going and you can't go further than the bottom leftmost pixel and therefore the start button basically becomes unmissable and, and very easy to go to if you want to do it with the mouse. And I have the muscle memory to do that unless I hit the keyboard button and, and I find myself going back to that a lot. So in a way, I'd almost like the start button to be on the left and everything else to be in the middle. 
but that's just not the case. So anyway, so my little rant here. I'll move it back to the center. Now, one of the things that is a little iffy right now in my mind is this, the taskbar is always at the bottom. You can't move it to the left or the top edge of the screen. And uh, that seems to be getting some criticism from, from people. And it's surprising me a little bit that Microsoft is doing that. So we'll see how that develops over time, if they'll give us a little more freedom there again. Now let's talk about the start menu a little bit. I'm gonna close my settings here. The start menu has changed a little, but again, not to a point where it'll be unusable or you'll have to relearn it or your users will have to relearn it. It just cleaned up a little bit. Things like the power options have, uh, are just flowing more natural. You have apps that are pinned and recommendations and you can of course go to your all app settings like before and see all your applications. Uh, but of course you can also start typing and, and look for an application. And so that's very similar to what it was like before. Works pretty well, uh, seems to come up with good things, uh, suggestions and yeah, again, just works pretty well, pretty straightforward. So that's, uh, that's what's to be expected. Uh, we have our settings for multiple desktops and so on right here integrated. Again, no big surprises there. What is new, however, is that we now have these widgets. Now these widgets show up, uh, you can customize that, of course. And it's really just, I guess, in a way, Windows catching up with what a lot of the other systems have, right? So just simple little components uh, that can in a consolidated way show you a lot of the things that are going on. Okay, so that's uh, one of the major new items is a better widget system. Now, similar, we actually have our notifications. Notifications have been cleaned up quite a bit. Uh, I, seem that, uh, I think they are a lot nicer than they used to be. And of course, issuing notifications into the notification center, which is something you can do as a developer relatively easily. Uh, through the Windows SDK is something that I would recommend more in Windows 11 than you've done it in the past because it's just a much nicer experience. And talking in general about the nicer experience, when you look at things that are in your tray, for instance, uh, it is much cleaned up and to me much more logical. So for instance, you know, you see the network sound battery as well as display brightness and, and volume controls and, and things like that have been unified into this one icon. And you can come in here and then you can look for your wireless networks and you see a good list of that here. And it's just the UI that, that again has been cleaned up and flows very nicely. In general, that's one of the themes that I like a lot about Windows 11. Microsoft says they wanted to build this Windows that feels very comfortable. That, that people just like, it feels welcoming, it feels very, very clean. And I think they really achieved that. When I look at you know the recent version of versions of Windows, say Windows 8 or, or Windows 10, Microsoft went into this mode where I always feel they wanted to out Apple Apple, where they just wanted to do these uh, straightforward, simple, clean UIs and you know, the, it, it's removing things and it's simplifying things and taking things out. And I actually am a big fan of that. Uh, you know, I'm a, a design enthusiast and I like the art of removing to create something that's clean. But there is an art to it. And the art to, uh, part was a bit missing, I feel. <clears throat> so it, it often feels to me like in Windows 10, when you look at a UI and we'll look at some specific examples of that, they just made it as simple as possible, put some labels on a form and just let it flow in and boom, that's the end of it. It's simple and therefore it must be beautiful. And and I don't know that they necessarily totally succeeded in that. I think they succeeded more in that in Windows 10 and Windows 8. But I feel Windows 11 is where people went in and the designers went in and they created these UIs that are super simple and clean, but they're also very, very carefully crafted to make a beautiful UI that just works. And, and I'm a big fan of that, I have to say. Uh, so really like that. There's lots of little UI things. Now people say, well, does that really matter too much to me? Does it matter that much that the notification center has been cleaned up? Well, the reality is maybe, maybe it's only marginal, right? Uh, I mean, to me, it matters. I think it matters in terms of being able to sell a, uh, an OS and, 
and not making people go to Mac and, and or make him come back from Mac. Uh, so I think it'll really, really help sell windows to the consumers and, and enterprises of the world. But yeah, it's not a revolutionary new feature. Don't get me wrong, right? It is, if in a way, just another version of Windows 10. But it feels to me like it's finally a finished version, a version that's nicely polished. I want to make sure I keep an eye on what's going on here. Uh, questions, will Windows 11 be available via partner channel like the Action Pack? Um, I assume so. I don't have any specific information about that, but I, I've not heard of any changes in how they deliver Windows. So if it wasn't there before. Um, another question is, is TPM 2.0 still available? The, that's a, an interesting uh, question. There's new hardware requirements and not all hardware that could run Windows 10 can run Windows 11. Like I have an old Surface Pro, like Surface Pro 2 that I wanted to install it on and it couldn't run it. And that had to do not so much with performance requirements, but more with security requirements. So TPM 2.0 is part of that. And yes, as far as I know, that's still the plan to go forward like that. Just making uh, the hardware requirements a little more where they can provide the level of security they want. But we'll see how that develops. I don't have any official news statements on that. Um, so that's with the questions. Um, Let's take a look at some of the things that are shipping as part of the standard UI. And I like to use the settings app as one of the main apps that demonstrates that. So if you think back of what the old settings app was like in, in Windows 10, it worked pretty well, but to me it was never really nicely crafted. But when I look at this here, this is the new settings app. Now, it's personal opinion, I get that, but to me, from a designer's point of view, it's it's just much cleaner, much more nicely done. It presents a lot more information than it did before, yet it seems to be more easily digestible. And that, to me, as a UI designer, is always one of the things that I really like. Right? So I immediately see some things like, okay, well, what's going on with my Windows update? I don't have to go into that. Uh, what's my OneDrive status? I can then drill into some of those areas like the display settings. And uh, as I'm going through my OBS streaming setup, it's a little slow. Performance, again, seems to be a little laggy right now, but again, it's a preview version, right? So I see all my different settings here beautifully arranged. And by the way, as I interact with this, you'll see what, uh, what Michael calls the fluid UI design in action. You as a developer can use a lot of that and we'll talk a lot of that. But things like, say, for instance, this little slider bar, you notice, I hope you can see that in the stream, as I move the mouse over, it immediately gives some feedback that it's hot, that I can do something with it. If I press the button again, it changes a little bit. So as I move this, I immediately see the response of this. And so it just works really well, I feel. Uh, in terms of giving the user enough feedback as to what's going on, what's... Uh, what's immediately usable. Um, so that's from a, just the UI design point of view, but then just from an app point of view, if you compare this, and I have some, some comparison screenshots, this is just so much more functional and clean than the old one. Uh, I just like it a lot better. I, I enjoy it quite a bit, I have to say. Now again, people say, well, that's just a settings app. What difference does that make to me? Well, reality is probably not that much, but just fundamentally that these things are available to me as a developer because I can build an app that's better designed without jumping through all these hoops and doing it all myself. I think that is a fairly important uh, aspect. I also want to bring up Windows Explorer real quick. Let's go into this. Now this is an app uh, obviously that we are using probably a lot more than the settings. Uh, it's also an app that right now is a little bit slow, I notice at times, so I'm sure that's just a preview issue. Um, and this again is going to be very recognizable to you, but it has been cleaned up. One of the most obvious things is no more ribbon. So the ribbon seems to be something that it's not gone, but it's fallen out of favor a little bit. And I think when you, when you really look at what the ribbon does, it, is, it works well in Office. Uh, even though it also makes things cluttered. And these days we try to build more streamlined UI. So even in Office, 
There's new preview versions you can get as an Office Insider that anyone can sign up for. And you'll see that the, the UI is more streamlined and I have a way to do a collapsed ribbon that just looks more like what we see right here. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you should expect all over the place. And to me, this is just a more cleaned up, more use, useful or usable version of uh, the Explorer UI. Another thing I want to point out here is I can, of course, minimize, maximize. I could do Windows left key to snap this thing to the side. But there also is a new feature built in called Snap Assist. And that is if I move my mouse over this button here and I let it hover there for just a second with, without pressing the button. If I just press this button, it maximizes the window like always. But if I just move the mouse over this button for a second, it brings up the Snap Assist menu. And this just allows me to quickly snap the window in more different ways than I could with just Windows left, right, or just by dragging it over with the mouse to dock it. Now, all the features that you are used to from the past, they are still there. So you can still do the grab it with the mouse at the top and dock it to the side. But we have this new Snap Assist feature. So I could go and I could say, well, let's move this Explorer menu or window, I should say, over to the side and take up a third of the screen. And then it asks me, what do you want to do with the rest of the screen? And I say, put the settings right there. And it just snaps it into different positions. And so I have a lot of different ways of doing that. And it just works really well. And by the way, this behavior of it asking what I wanted to do with the empty space, you can toggle that on and off. Uh, so does it bring up uh, an overview of the other windows? You pick the one that you want to snap into that space is that something you want or do you just want to dock this one window to the side and and then decide what to do with it now these also resize together now so if i now come in here and, and move this in some way you notice that both of them will move again this is behavior that you can toggle on and off you have a tremendous amount of control over how you can customize all of this and i know you as developers are gonna enjoy that kind of behavior now, another thing you'll notice here is as I do this, I hope this will stream well, we kind of get this translucent uh, preview of where the image was or where the, where the window should go, I should say. Uh, this is one of the examples of where Microsoft uses materials in the UI. So there's different materials that you can apply to your windows. Uh, it always applies to the bottom most thing in your UI. Uh, and so, for instance, this one is called acrylic. It's the semi-transparent thing. It just provides this soft look. Uh, also, this color that's used here in the settings app, uh, it's called mica is what the material is. It's another material you can apply. And Microsoft, it is very subtly tinted towards your overall theme that's being used. So if you have a theme that's more bluish, this will have a very, very faint blue hue to itself. If you have something that's more greenish, well, you get the idea. Um, and it just makes, it just looks good, right? Again, it's not functionally like, oh my God, I gotta have Windows 11 because it does that. But it just provides a really polished look for the UI. Um, and so, you know, this goal that Microsoft has to, to make Windows appear soft, to make Windows appear friendly, the rounded corners that are everywhere, right? You'll see, that all the windows now have rounded corners. You see the text box has rounded corners. You'll notice that the controls, the buttons, everything has rounded corners. Um, now, you know, in a way they make such a big deal out of that that it's even funny uh, because it's just a rounded corner, right? Who cares? But, but it does give a nice, soft, welcoming uh, overall look to the UI, I feel. And, and that was the goal and they clearly achieved that. So is that important to you? Well, that's something you have to decide. I personally, uh, when I go back to Windows 10 now, it really looks unfinished and, and hard edged to me. But again, to other people, it may not be that important. Um, so question online about the new store uh, with PWAs and Android apps, uh, are they there? I'll talk about the store in quite a bit more detail, uh, but the short answer to that question is yes. All right, so that's uh, just kind of a quick lap around Windows from a user's point of view. And I understand we're developers and we are more interested in the developer side of things, but I think it's kind of important to just know, well, what are the things actually that are coming our way and that we can use in, in our own apps as well. Let me get my 
slide presentation back up and running and moved so I can see it and you can see it. Now I put in another little slide here. I'm still trying to manage these, these windows. Uh, whatever. Um, I put another slide in here. I'm not going to go through this, but this has some notes in it. So when you download the slide deck later, you can kind of go through this and look at some of the things that I talked about. So this is more of a slide for people that are wanting to get the slide deck to recap what we have. Now here is uh, just a quick comparison between the UIs that we had. And I picked out this add and remove applications feature. Uh, that we had in Windows 10 and we of course have in Windows 11. And I picked this because this was one of my pet peeves. I hated this particular dialogue. Why did I hate this dialogue? Well, it just looked A, unfinished to me and B, it was not very functional. It didn't give me all the information I wanted and just the way the layout worked, I thought was basically broken. Um, so what we had here is a list of the applications installed in Windows. And you see some interesting information like the size, you see the name, you see when it was installed, maybe even who made it. But one of the things that I always hated is you have this display, this, this window, and it's this wide, but you have all this white space, yet the list over here is cut off. Well, we wanted it clean and simple, Microsoft said, but to me, this was not clean and simple. It was unfinished and unfunctional because you went through this list, and I'm sure you've experienced this yourself, and you, you'd see things that said Microsoft Visual Studio and then it was cut off. And you had 15 of those things in the list and you could never read what it was. So as soon as you had an app with a longer name, it just didn't work anymore. And yet on the right side of this window, you have all this white space. And I'm like, well, why don't you just resize the list to fit it all? Oh no, that makes too complicated a UI. So I, I hated this UI with a passion. And, and again, it's one little feature, how often are you using this? But it's representative for a lot of the things that happened in Windows 10, I think. Now, if we compare this with this feature in Windows 11, I just think that's much, much more functional and more polished. So there's a few different things we see in here. We see, first of all, the navigation part, I think just looks cleaned up and better. Now that's personal taste. Do you like colored icons or do you like the monochrome black and white view that we had before? Um, but then there's just more functional features in here. Like this, this helps you decide where can my apps be installed from? Where does this stuff come from? How can I share them? The variety of settings. Then I have my app list. I can search the app list. I can sort and filter the app list. And then I see my actual apps. And guess what? It is resized in width to take advantage of the maximum space of the screen. Now, I can't believe I even have to talk about this, that we had UIs in Windows 10 that, that didn't have that. Now, when you look at the actual list, it draws your eye to important aspects like the name, the size if it's available. But then it also has just a lot more information available. Like if I'm interested in this .NET reflector thing here, I can immediately see the exact version of this. So it's more functional to me, especially as a technical person. So this list to me is more easily consumable visually, yet it provides a ton more information and features than the old one did. And this, I picked this out because I think it's representative for something that we have in Windows 11, just things that, yeah, are they that big a deal? I don't know, to me they are. I think making things more functional, cleaner, easily consumable for the user is just something that we should all strive for. And, you know, we've had this debate for years. Developers tend to be focused on the functional part of things. Does it work? Okay, it works fine, that's good enough. But the reality is we've seen now, uh, I think the debate has been settled, that looks and good design and and ease of use and productivity and just being able to look at something and quickly absorb it is very, very important. We see that those things sell better. We see that those things sell better in the consumer marketplace, but we also see that in enterprise applications where productivity is very important, those things are the apps that get picked up. So I think to you as a developer, it may not be what you're worried about and what keeps you awake at night, but nevertheless, you should be thinking about this because it will decide the success of your application. And that's why I say when I have to go back from 
the thing that we have on the right back to Windows 10, when I had that experience, I'm just like, no, I'm not going back to that. I want the new version. Okay, let's see, you got some more questions here. I'll move my window out of the way a little bit. Uh, questions, how much uh, more CPU power and memory do we need? Uh, I don't think there's any real difference between Windows 10 and 11. So just the overall memory consumption, I think, is going to be very similar. Now, I just bought myself a new computer. Uh, I went from my Microsoft Surface Book, which I was happy with. It's probably three years old at this point, and it runs Windows 11 just as fine as it does Windows 10. But I still, I went to a new Lenovo, and that Lenovo has 64 uh, gigs of memory. And I really like that. I, I like it for things like virtual machines. I like it because Visual Studio 2022 is a 64-bit app, and that consumes and, and can take advantage of more memory. So I think you, you may want to go with a little more oomph just because the apps that are going to be running are going to be taking advantage more of that. But generally speaking, if your computer runs fine and can satisfy the security requirements, you should be fine with the same level of hardware in Windows 11 as you are in Windows 10. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the specifics of the UI, the control look. We've already seen we're going a lot with rounded corners. We are also going with these new materials. And these things are just available to you out of the box. So we have this, this refreshed look that you'll get in a lot of your applications. The web browser will pick, <coughs> excuse me, um, the web browser will pick that up. Uh, and mo most of your Windows applications will pick that up. Uh, plus, you can really go out of your way to say, I want to take advantage of a lot of these new things. So there's some things that the UI is going to pick up, like buttons are probably going to be rounded if you use say, an old WinForms app. But are you really getting all these super fancy animated, automatically sliding and drawing your attention to the part that the, the eye should wander to? Uh, are you really getting all of that? Well, for some of that, you, you have to go out of your way to use WinUI 3. So WinUI 3 is this control library that forms the basis of many things at this point. Uh, this comes from the Windows team. There's a lot of stuff in it that's good to use and that's being used automatically or as the foundation by other things. So if you are building, uh, let's say, a .NET MAUI app. MAUI, we'll talk about that briefly. It's this cross-platform Xamarin version that runs on Windows, iOS, Android, Mac, and so on. Well, when you build a Windows app with it, it actually uses this automatically. So if you put a button on your screen, it will use a WinUI 3 button. Uh, if you put a drop down, and you get the idea, right? So uh, that's the library that you want to use if you can. It's currently available as a preview, but it's a stable preview. So it's actually supported and you can use it, I think version point, uh, eight or something like that. Uh, it requires Windows 10 or 11, but you know, going back to Windows 10 at this point, Probably not that big a deal, but you do need to be aware of, you know, they'll have to support an older version, Windows 8 or whatever, then this may not work for you. Let's just take a quick look. There's actually an application you can get. It's called the SAML Controls Gallery. And this app you can find in the store. And this gives you a pretty good example of all the things that are going on. And you can even download that as uh, the source code. It's on GitHub. So this is an app that shows off all the controls and all this new UI, and it's itself built with that. So you see, as I'm just starting this app, uh, it looks like a Windows 11 app. Uh, it will look like a Windows 10 app if you launch it in Windows 10 because it automatically does that. Uh, but you get things like the new menu on the side and then the new styles here. And we could now go through this and we could explore the things that are going on. So what's a button like if you do WinUI? Well, here's your button and you can you know, mouse over it and you can see what the behavior is and, and play with it a little bit and just different text flow options and all that. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. And we can move into things like a dropdown. What does a dropdown now look like? Well, those things you'll probably get with a lot of the simpler things as well. Uh, we have things like that slider that we talked about before. And again, the behavior that if I move the mouse over, it immediately reacts. So we can see it's enabled. When I click it, it does something. When I move it, it does something. Just beautifully designed 
Uh, we have things like a toggle switch. That may not be something you had. This is not the same as a radio button. It's this thing that moves back and forth, right? So it's beautifully designed. As you see, when I move the mouse over, it immediately changes a little when I when I then click it. See that the the nubbin in here? I don't know what that's called. <laughs> uh, immediately reacted, right? So I go here, I click on it, it immediately reacts, and then boom, snaps over to the other side. And so it's just very, very detailed crafted uh, by the Microsoft designers. Now we could look at things like a checkbox, probably in here somewhere, there it is. So that looks pretty much like, like you would expect. Uh, the one thing that I don't really like, I have to say, and I hope this is gonna change a little bit, is radio buttons. This is a selected radio button. To me, this doesn't really look selected. So personal preference there, but that's one thing that I don't like. And then there's things that you wouldn't necessarily expect like rating controls. And then as we go further, we'll see that there's a lot of very interesting, more sophisticated controls. Things like date time pickers, calendar views, um, layout elements. This is where things get really interesting. Right? So with things like expander. So those of you using WPF, uh, you will know that. Um, media elements. Then we got a whole section of controls and toolbars of different kinds. And I'm not gonna go through all of those, but you have some very advanced layout options like, you know, touch enable controls, flyout controls like this. Uh, we got things built in for motion. Uh, we got um, controls uh, like an accordion type of control, pivot controls. Right, stuff like that, uh, just all built in. And you know, we could go on and on and on and I could probably spend my entire allowed time just in this, but there is some pretty advanced controls in here. Um, and, and you can use them. And as we'll see, as we go further through this presentation, the nice thing is that this is now usable everywhere. So if you have a WinForms app, for instance, these things are now available to you. If you have a WPF app, these things are available to you. If you have a UWP app, these things are available to you. Samarin and so on, right? So that's one of the big news uh, with what's called Project Reunion, or at least that was the code name. It's called, now called the Windows App SDK, is that these things are now available to you everywhere. And by the way, the Windows App SDK is not just these UI controls. It's also functionality like the ability to call into Win32 APIs uh, from everywhere, right? So lots and lots of stuff going on here. I encourage you to just play around with this a little bit. Look at the, you know, what's, what's new. Oh, we have an animated icon now, right? We have new icons in Windows 11. Those show up automatically and you just kind of get them out of the box. Uh, we have navigation, like this navigation that I'm doing here, going back and forth is something that's, that's built in. Um, this new info bar control and so on, right? I, I don't want to bore you with this here, but the point is explore this. There's lots of stuff to like. You know, we do mostly web development at this point. I'm not going to say I'm, I'm doing mostly Windows development as, as just quantity wise. We build more web apps than anything else. But when I go into something like this and go back to these nicely crafted, amazingly detailed UIs, that then end up super clean. It is, it is really nice that we have all of this available. And of course, some of this can show up in your web app. Right? So, so cool stuff here, check it out. It's called the SAML control library. You can get it from GitHub, but the easiest way to get it is just install it from the store and then you always have the latest version. This is also theme aware. So if you were in uh, dark mode, this would be dark automatically. And the same would apply to your app when you use this stuff. So, so check that out, some good information in here and some, some nice advanced controls to see. Another new thing that we have in Windows 11 that's significant to us as developers is we have a new font that's kind of usable as the default font. It's called Sego UI Variable. Sego UI Variable is an evolution of the Sego UI font, and it is just further improvements towards readability. For instance, when the font gets very small, it changes its characteristics a little bit to be more readable. When it's very large, same deal, changes its characteristics to be a little bit more readable. So it may add more spacing so we don't get as many anti-aliasing artifacts. It might 
be a little run a little tall compared to uh, its actual font size and so it stays very readable and in fact I have my Visual Studio open here and you know I'm going through the menu here and I've set that menu to use that new uh, Sego UI variable font and you're not going to look at this and say oh this looks totally different but what you would notice is if I went to a very small font it would remain much more visible and readable to you um, without being actually large right so so just some nice work from the Microsoft designers uh, to get that going. So you can use that. I recommend you use that as your default font in your apps. If you don't, if you're not on Windows 11, it degrades back, and and so it's it's safely usable. Uh, so question online. Um, I'm looking to buy a new developer laptop. Uh, which model do you recommend, and what Lenovo did I buy? Um, I don't even know the exact uh, model number, but it's a uh, X1 or C1 or something like that. 64 gigs of RAM, uh, terabyte hard drive. Uh, I pick the process. I always like picking the process that's just one under the, the very top. So it has an i7 whatever. Um, I find that going to the very top of the line with the processor is very expensive and doesn't do that much for me. And I picked a Lenovo. I had a Lenovo in the past. I've always liked it a lot. Uh, they're not quite as ugly anymore as they used to be. And so I'm kind of excited to be back on a Lenovo. But you know, I'm not endorsing Lenovo or being paid by them in any way. It's just something I like. I, I had a Surface Book before. I liked my Surface Book a lot. Uh, but the battery is starting to die and that's hard to replace. And so I decided I really wanted to go back to a Lenovo. And uh, you know, I can if you send me an email, I get you the exact specs that I got. the The thing with uh, buying a computer right now is uh, the delivery time was four months, or at least it was supposed to be four months. I got a little earlier, but they are having trouble with getting certain parts, uh, the chips shortage problem, right? So uh, it can take a while. But so yeah, I can get you the exact specs that I had. But it's not anything outlandish. Uh, you know, this computer that I'm on right now is three and a half years old and it still works perfectly fine. Uh, the biggest limiting factor to me is the battery. And so I just wanted one where I can replace the battery in the future. All right, uh, back to the presentation here. Another thing that's kind of along the lines of uh, the font thing is uh, there's new icons that ship in Windows 11. So little side remark here, but you can use those out of the box as well. So let's move along and talk about some other features here. Now here is one of the things that to me, functionally speaking, is the biggest deal in Windows 11. And this is actually, it's being built with Windows 11, but it will also be available in, in Windows 10. And that is the new Microsoft Store. That was another one of my pet peeves all along. The Microsoft Store was borderline useless. And in fact, um, I can't tell you all the details, but there was a country in which the store went dark for a few days and nobody even noticed. That gives you an idea of the popularity of this store. Uh, so the old store is basically a store for UWP apps. And we know the popularity of the UWP apps wasn't very high. So the store didn't have a lot of apps that were very useful. Therefore, users didn't use it. And, and therefore, few developers put apps in the store and it was this downward spiral. And that in light of being on the most plat popular platform on the, on the planet. Because let's be clear on this. Windows is the most largely deployed operating system with the most active user base on the planet. And when you think about the fact that we really didn't have a good store to get our apps in the hands of the people, whether that's for selling the apps or whether it's just a good delivery mechanism. To me, it's outrageous. And that's what got fixed in Windows 11 uh, with this new store. Like it's getting fixed this year in Windows 10 and Windows 11. So the new Microsoft Store is made to reach all users and consumers on these platforms and give them access to all applications that you can run on Windows. So no more being locked out of the store because you have a WinForms app or no more being locked out of the store uh, because you had a PWA app or something like that. You can put any kind of app into that app store. And Microsoft is putting all their own apps into the app store. So this really is likely to become the standard way of deploying apps for Windows. 
And so you can do anything you want, right? If it runs on Windows, it can likely come from the store. Now you're gonna say, oh, that's all nice and good, but I'm selling my app and now I gotta give a cut to Microsoft. Well, no, actually Microsoft is introducing new ways, new commerce models around the store because there's really two things that go, or, or multiple things that go with the store, but two of them are A, the delivery model. How does it actually work to publish in a store and what flexibility do you have? Now, typically when you publish into the Microsoft store, you use MSIX and that works really well, but, but there's other ways of doing it. You have more freedom with that. And so there's the technical part of, of embracing everything. But then there's also the commerce part. How do you advertise your app? How do you monetize your app? Uh, is there advertisements in the app? Now, if you like that sort of stuff, is there in-app purchases? If so, how does all of that work? What's, what's the commerce engine behind this? And Microsoft provides a commerce engine. And if you use that, you're giving Microsoft the cut. And you know, it's, I don't know how many percent that the, the cut that Microsoft takes is actually has gone down considerably. But if you use the Microsoft commerce engine, then it just works, right? You have the, the automatic charging and you get the money and, and all those features are just there. But if you say, no, no, I have my own thing and I don't want Microsoft to take a cut of that, then I have all of that set up and I'm doing my own commerce and worrying about all that stuff. You can, you can now put your app into the Microsoft store without giving Microsoft a penny. So that pretty much eliminates that hurdle if, if you want to go that route. So that is great, right? I think the, the, the news around the Microsoft store are all around good. There's also better browser integration. You can. Uh, use what's called the pop-up store where you on your website can have a link to your app and you click the button and it actually pops into the store and it, it triggers the store's delivery mechanism. So lots and lots of cool stuff. Now this is relatively early days. So the store, while it is kind of a Windows 11 feature, if you want to think of it like that, it's really a separate development. And so just because you have Windows 11 doesn't mean you have the new store, but you can get the preview version of the store. Uh, you, you can go to this link here, aka.ms slash new store to also read up about it a little more. And some of the things about how do you actually publish into the store, what are all the different options you have, how do you do certain specific things, uh, they are not all known to us yet. And I'll have some specific examples. Uh, but what we do know that you can build a Windows app that MSIX is a really good experience if you, if you want to use that, but it's not the only thing that's supported. So cool stuff coming there. And to me, that's one of the biggest new features because it now opens up the entire world to serve my, my apps up to them, whether they're consumer apps or whether it's an internal thing that, that I just need a publishing platform on, but it's really just my internal enterprise app that I don't want everyone to have access to, only my own people. I, I can do all of that now. Um, so a little bit of an overview here. What can we publish? It's, you know, people always go, oh, you said, but can I also do Electron apps? Yes, you can do Electron apps. Can I do Fotino apps? The stuff that we are supporting, uh, open source initiative. Yes, you can. Can I do PWAs? Yes, I can. But what about my old UWP app? Yes, you can. Right. So that's, that's the important stuff there. Um, Android apps. Now, this is probably the most surprising new thing with Windows 11. Windows 11 can now run Android apps. It does this by this thing called the subsystem for Android, the Windows subsystem for Android. If you're using the Windows subsystem for Linux, where you're essentially running Linux within Windows, like think of it as a virtual machine that, work, that, that integrates really well with Windows, um, conceptually at least. Well, they built something very similar for Android and it's technically mind-boggling because how do you actually run something that's really designed for this ARM instructions that is a completely different platform that, that Android runs on. And you know, they had, Microsoft had to work with Intel to make that work, and, but they did. Well, whatever the details are, it just works. So you can now run Android apps on Windows. Now we know that these apps can be served up by the, uh, by the Amazon App Store. So Microsoft did a partnership with Amazon and this is gonna integrate in the overall deployment experience. Now, we don't know exactly how that works yet. The details around that have, are still a little bit nebulous. So I couldn't show you an example of, of publishing an Android app to Windows 11 and install it, but we know it's gonna be through the Amazon App Store. So what we have done as a company, you know, we have apps like the Code Magazine Reader app that's in the Google Play Store for Android, 
And, you know, we used to use the Amazon App Store in the past, but it's kind of a fringe thing and it wasn't important enough for us to do it. Well, we are now working on putting that app into the Amazon Store again because we know we ultimately want to support these Android apps on Windows. And then you'll be able to just install the Code Magazine Reader Android app in Windows. So that's kind of important for you, I think, as a developer. If you're building Android apps, that's a little bit of a game changer, right? Android apps may have just become much more important. The Amazon App Store has become much more important. And maybe building things like Maui or Samarin apps has become more important because that could be your Windows app. And Android apps are pretty flexible in how big they can be. I mean, we're showing a screenshot of TikTok here running in a typical phone form factor. But, you know, it could be a tablet app. And, and all of a sudden it's like, well, that's the same form factor as my Windows screen. And wow, I can build basically a Windows app with Android now. So that's pretty fundamental if you want to think of it like that. Question online is, well, where's the control panel? Well, the control panel is, uh, if we're talking about the same thing, it's essentially the settings app, but you can go into the start menu and look for the control panel. All of that stuff is still there. All right, so how do you publish to the store? Well, like I said, um, you know, there's a submission process. MSIX is a great way to publish these packages, but it's not the only option. You can do PWAs, and the, really the biggest unknown at this point is the Android App Store, and there's just not that much information available. I even tried to use some internal channels to get to this, and they're like, ah, we, we want to finalize our story a bit more before we can announce it. Okay, now on to a different topic, Teams integration. Teams has become a very important product for Microsoft. And it's just become much more important because it is integrated directly into Windows. So in my taskbar here, if I come down here, you see there's a chat icon and I can go into that and this immediately launches uh, Teams. Now this seems to be still a little bit rough and it takes quite a while to come up actually. And then you actually, it's not integrated yet with your corporate Teams account. I'm assuming that's what will happen uh, as this goes a little further along but it basically is kind of a personal Teams thing. So I don't know what the exact final story. Teams has always been a little weak with tenant switching and, and going to multiple accounts. I'm really hoping that'll be fixed there. We don't know that yet, uh, but you know, here it is. Um, just some basic integration. And let's see if I can get rid of this again or not. There we go. Um, so that's just important to know that that is there. We've talked, I think uh, two months ago, we've talked and had a simple sample about how to extend Teams, that I think Teams is becoming this very important platform that you can build apps for, that you can, any app that you build these days will probably have a collaborative component. So one of the examples I used was basically an application used in law firms. If I have a case management system, uh, then that manages everything related with this case that I'm working on for, for a client. Well, if I do Teams meetings with this client, it would be important that that case management system integrates with Teams. So if the client sends me new thing th things through Teams or, or says something or, or uploads a new document, then I want that to automatically be integrated in my case management system. And I want it to be tied to that meeting so I know where it came from and all these things. So it, Teams becomes a platform to build for. And when you go through all the apps you've ever built, you'll probably discover that there's things in every app that could benefit from this collaborative way of working. So in short, I think extending Teams is very important. So if you're interested in that, go back two months ago. You can watch that Stata.net video and I'll show a small sample and I'm sure we'll do more about that in the future. But the short version is you're building a React web app that then runs in any incarnation of Teams, whether it's Windows, mobile, or, or web, or anything. And now this has just become more important because it's right there in the start menu of Windows 11. So, so that's, that's a little bit finicky. Like I noticed that when I first installed Windows, it didn't show up and then it came with some kind of upgrade and was like, oh, well, it's probably just not there yet. And then I put it on a different computer, and the same thing happened. So I'm not totally sure what the deal is there. I should probably do some more research, but, um, but that's Teams integration. I also want to mention uh, relatively quickly here, the Windows subsystem for Linux. If you're a Linux guy, which I'm only partially, I use Linux to run a lot of stuff in Azure, which by the way, um, just as a little side note, we just took a lot of the stuff we had in Azure, like app services, websites, and moved them from a Windows-based deployment to Linux-based deployment, and it almost eliminated two-thirds of our expenses. So, so I'm a Linux fan in that sense, 
but I'm not the kind of guy who runs a Linux machine and, and lo knows uh, command line uh, stuff for Linux inside out, right? Uh, but it is pretty interesting if you're doing some Linux development, you can do that on your machine and you have been able to do that for a while. Now, what's new in Windows 11 is it's easier to deal with that. So installing the Windows subsystem for Linux is easy. It's just this command. So what you do is you go into some kind of terminal. Like here, I'm using Windows terminal and... and uh, you could just go in here, like in this case, I'm in PowerShell and I could type WSL, that's just always there. And then uh, I could type WSL install, like I'm showing here. And I've already done that, but that installs the whole subsystem. And then you can pick uh, different uh, distributions, in other words, different versions of Linux. And I'm canceling this right now, I'm not going to do that. But so that's how I got, for instance, this version of Ubuntu running within Windows 11. Right, so I have my full Linux OS that's starting up right now within Windows 11. And you're gonna say, well, that was already available in, in Windows 10. And that's true, it's just gotten a little easier. Plus, new features have been added. So once this starts up here, uh, uh, I'll show you some other stuff. So here it is, it's booting up and there's my Linux workstation again. I don't know what you'd even call that. But now here's a, co a cool new feature. You can now do UI things, GUI things right in here. So for instance, I installed the Google Chrome browser in here and I can just launch that. And it shows some warnings, but that doesn't matter. And here is Google Chrome. Now you're going to say, ah, oh, that's just the Windows app. Well, no, it's not. If you look very closely, you'll notice that this thing looks a little different. This is not a Windows 11 window. This is a Linux GUI window. And if you look down here in the taskbar, you'll see it has the little penguin in the icon. It has the little penguin in the icon here. This is an honest to God Linux window that is now running integrated into Windows 11. It's not running inside of a you know VM window or anything like that. It's just running inside of Windows 11. It shows up in the taskbar. You know, I can alt tab around and it shows up. It's just very uh, well integrated. And so that's kind of big news, right? If you want to do any kind of development that has to do with Linux GUI, then that's a very useful thing to have. And, and by the way, the thing that I mentioned before for Tino, which is this open source initiative that we are supporting among others, um, that is essentially a more lightweight modern version of Electron. If you are doing development for Linux with it, this is awesome because you now you can now start these Fotino apps right inside of your Windows 11 box using the Windows subsystem for Linux and just do your entire development there, including the GUI. So that's kind of cool. Now the Windows terminal, by the way, that I just used, that is now shipping in the box. You don't have to install it on Windows 10. You can install it. And if you're doing a lot of command line stuff, I would recommend you do. But in Windows 11, that's just always there now. So that's a nice, another nice little detail that's going on. Okay, what else do we have? Let's talk briefly about Edge because Edge as the new Microsoft browser. If you haven't looked into that, it's a Chromium based browser. So it's the rendering engine is the same as Chrome and Microsoft and Google are now maintaining that together has become very popular. Microsoft has become the biggest contributor to the Chromium open source initiative. Uh, so that's been there for a while now, right? And of course they keep improving it. Now, one of the things that's most important for us as developers is the WebView 2 control. The WebView 2 control is this control component that you can use as a developer. So if you need any kind of HTML rendering capabilities in your app, the WebView 2 control is the way to go. Uh, it's more lightweight than embedding a Chromium control, integrates better, and essentially is Chromium. Right? So you can drop that into your app. You could do that because maybe you're building a hybrid app where you're just building an outer shell for this web app. Or you do it because you have a Windows app that needs to display HTML as part of it. So we often use this to mix and match things. So the good news is WebView 2 is now automatically deployed with Windows 11. So you have this control in the box that's just always there and you don't have to worry about a sizable install or anything like that. It is also an evergreen version. 
So therefore, it'll update itself and you'll always get the latest security features, the latest support for HTML standards and so on. Now, Edge itself, or the whole suite of things that make up this browser, uh, is getting improved very rapidly. So there's lots of new dev tools, like uh, you know, one example that people always show is improved dev tool support for working with Flexbox, but there's many other things. This is not an Edge presentation, but I just wanted to mention that anyway. Let's talk about .NET specifically. A few things that I want to mention, Visual Studio 2022. We've mentioned that in a few Stata.NETs in the past. We now have Preview 2 available, and it is pretty much exactly what you would think it is. It's closer to a release-ready version. And I'm using Visual Studio 2022 quite a bit for regular development. You can open your 2019 projects in 2022. They're, they're totally, it doesn't convert it or anything like in the old days. It's just an editor that works on top of that file set. Uh, so Preview 2 is now available. New features are integrated, like the new icon stuff I've showed you wasn't there in Preview 1. It's also localized in multiple languages. So if you are not an English speaker natively and you want, say, a German version, uh, then that's now in, uh, in there. Also, some of the features that we've talked about in the past, like this hot reload, which is a really cool way of doing debugging because it, it's almost like an edit and continue button steroids. So you can do very advanced things, have your app up, and, and then you change something in source code and just make the app refresh and it maintains all the state. Uh, it doesn't say, oh, I have to reload this window and boom, now you're there with an empty window. It just finagles it in on the fly somehow. I don't even know how. And so if you're interested in that, I showed a demo of that in last month's data.net. And this has now much better support for more scenarios. And basically it does what you would have seen if you watched, say, the build uh, example of that. And, you know, it's improved support for MAUI and Blazor apps. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment here, but that's in there as well. Let's talk about Windows development in general. I've already talked about this in the past, but WPF and WinForms are now first-class citizens in .NET, what we would, would have used to call .NET Core, right? So .NET 5, .NET 6, you can build your WPF and your WinForms app in those environments. And I think it's important. People always say, well, what does it really do? It still looks like my WinForms app. True, but you're on the latest platform. You automatically get all the latest dialogues, you get the latest features, you have access to the latest SDKs, you have access to the latest Azure APIs and all of that. If you are on the full platform, the, the old, let's call it the legacy 4.8 framework, you're kind of in a dead end, right? It's not gonna get improved much. It's bug fixes, yes, support, yes. New features, no, not really. So if you don't wanna be in a dead end environment, move your apps to .NET 5 or 6, and it's easy. You basically have this conversion tool. I have a link to that somewhere later in my slides, and most apps convert relatively easily, uh, unless you do something really special in them. Um, so I encourage you to move forward, move your WPF, WinForms, and just all the .NET apps onto that platform. It's now gotten so easy that you know we're doing this for a number of our customers. We're just taking old stuff that we built and we just move them onto this new platform so we can then have access to all the other new stuff that's becoming available and security fixes and so on. Designer support is there, better support for click once, MSIX, all of that. All right, so I encourage you to do that. Now, here's something interesting. When you build a new, say, WinForms app, or you run your WinForms app for that matter, the existing one, you will automatically get your Windows 11 look and feel because WinForms uses all the OS components. And as one line in your startup project, in fact, I have an example for that right here. Let's bring that up, I think it was this one. So this is just, I just went in and I, I created a new WinForms app out of the box and super simple, right? So if we go into the uh, designer, you'll see I popped a few controls onto this. Uh, button check boxes, radio buttons, and and it's, it's still initializing here, but it'll look pretty much exactly like you think it will. And, and this is all default template stuff, but this default template has this one line in here, enable visual styles. That's important. If your old app doesn't have that, you want to put that in. And if you do that, you will then get a, an, an app that just looks like a modern app. So as I'm launching this, you'll see that we get a Windows 11 looking app.
And anyway, it's taken a long time. I'm not sure that it's even worth waiting for this because it's so simple. But that's kind of the point. And so you're building this WinForms app and on every version of Windows you run this on, it'll just look right as long as you have that enable visual styles line in your startup code. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess we're not going to wait for this. It's not that exciting. But, but that's how that works. And it'll probably pop up here in a moment once it gets compiling and, and happy. And that, by the way, is one of the only things that I noticed that hasn't worked perfect in, in Windows 11 is some of those file system things like opening a, a save dialog sometimes can be really slow. I'm not sure if it's specific to my machine, although I've heard other people have that problem too. Um, so that's a little slow. I also noticed like my streaming setup here with OBS and combining it with that stuff is not that fast. But that's the only things that I've really noticed so far in this new environment. And, and here is that window, right? So it just looks, has the rounded buttons, has the new text box styles, the radio button style I don't like, <laughs> and all that just works as long as you put that line in. If you're building a WPF app, WPF is different. WPF renders every pixel itself. So when you run WPF on Windows 7, WPF has a style set that looks like Windows 7. When you do it on Windows 8, it has a style set like Windows 8. When you do it on Windows 10, it has a style set like Windows 10. Currently, it does not yet have a style set for Windows 11. And I inquired with Microsoft about this and they're like, oh yeah, we're aware of that and it needs new styles. And, and you know, my question is, well, when do we get those styles? And, uh, you know, so we don't have an answer to that yet. But presumably those styles will be forthcoming and then your WPF app should look just like it does in uh, uh, WinForms or any other Windows 11 app. Okay. Now, of course, you could go out of your way and you could use WinUI 3 buttons and text boxes and so on. And that might be the way going forward anyway. But, you know, you also want your WPF app that you're bringing forward to just look right. And hopefully Microsoft will come out with the appropriate styles for that. Okay, we already talked about uh, Windows App SDK formerly known as Project Reunion, that's where they reunified all this stuff together. Uh, you can create a new project in uh, Visual Studio, pick WinUI, search for WinUI, there's templates for that. You can also go to GitHub. On GitHub, this is still called Project Reunion. You'll still see that Project Reunion code name pop up in a variety of ways uh, or, or places, but that's gonna go away. It's gonna be called all just the Windows App SDK, the app for building all kinds of Windows app. Um, this is the upgrade assistance that, uh, that I mentioned before. If you go to this URL, you can download the upgrade assistant. What it does is it looks at your old .NET 4.8, let's say, or, or older project, and it takes the project structure and it converts it into the new .NET 5, .NET 6, .NET Core project structure. It replaces all the dependencies to make sure it brings down the right packages. And for the most part, your app should convert very, very easily unless you went out of your way to do odd components that aren't available. Um, but for the most part, that's like I've, uh, in, in the real world, I found that this actually works very, very straightforward and, and you shouldn't have a lot of problems with it. Now, side note, uh, I know a lot of people on the call today use our framework, code framework for WPF is a subsection of our Code Framework uh, initiative. If you're unfamiliar with this, Code Framework is this open source framework. It's free, I'm not trying to sell you anything here, but it's what we use internally for our app development and we made that available as open source. And especially the WPF components as well as the API slash service components are very strong. Uh, so you can build WPF apps with this and it has lots of different themes and so on, uh, which would also, by the way, allow us to fix the shortcoming uh, of not having a Win 11 theme right now in case Microsoft is slow with this. Uh, but anyway, we have put on GitHub a first version that targets Windows 6, uh, .NET 6, right? So you can take your code framework uh, 4.8, 4.5, 4.0 version and move it to .NET 5 or .NET 6 with this with practically no code changes and should work very, very easily and getting all the latest and the greatest. So. That's important because we don't want you to be in a dead end. And again, like I said, we have a number of customers where we just move their apps forward. And, and a lot of them are code framework apps, not all of them, but it's just so easy. It just makes sense to make that leap rather than being stuck on a dead end 
version of the framework. Another side note for Tino. Um, there's been articles in Code Magazine. We've done webcasts about this. You can go watch them. For Tino is essentially a more modern version of Electron, allowing you to build HTML apps for uh, uh, with a HTML-based interface cross-platform, including Linux and Mac and Android and iOS and, and of course, Windows. And you, you can use .NET technologies to do that with. And I'm not going to go into a lot more detail here, but check that out. Again, it's an open source thing that we support. It's not something we started, but we kind of took the reins and ran with it and, and, and hope, you know, we, we welcome people's involvement in this and so on. Check that out. And of course, that's going to run well on Windows 11. And of course, you can put that into the Windows 11 store. Um, now, here's an interesting topic. I've already showed you that Windows 11 has these new widgets. Right, this stuff here. And as a developer, you go, I want to develop some of those widgets. And the answer is you can. Quick, next question is how can you? And the answer to that is we don't quite know yet. The assumption is that this will be some kind of web environment, possibly React based, but none of that is really clear. And again, I tried to use some internal channels at Microsoft to see uh, what information I could give you here today. The current answer just is, it's unannounced and they're still fiddling with it. But you will be able to create those widgets. So that makes a lot of sense, right? Like I talked before about, oh, I'd like my Code Magazine Android Reader app to run in uh, Windows 11 so you guys can read Code Magazine using that app if you choose to do so. Well, the same goes for widgets. I want a Code Magazine Reader widget that shows you the latest articles and so on. So we will definitely do that, but it is a little unclear at this point how that's gonna work but you will be able to do it. Um, PWA is progressive web apps. What is that? If you've never done that, it's basically a web app compiled into its own window and runs more as a standalone app, looks just like a Windows uh, or whatever other operating system app you're on. PWAs are becoming more and more popular and you can now put them into the store. And in fact, there is this thing that Microsoft initiated, which is called pwabuilder.com. You can go to that and that provides a tool set. You can just point this thing at your URL. You say, this is my app, what's missing? And it'll say, oh, well, it's a website and it's a, you know, whatever, a few based web app, um, Angular and what, whatever your web app is. But it'll say, oh, you're missing a manifest. So we know a bit more about, you know, what's the icon that goes with it or, or things like that, right? Or it says, security wise, you have a problem with this, that and the other. And, and then you can use this, it'll tell you what to do. And you can also use it to actually bundle it. And now you get a bundle of an app that you can put into the app store. So that becomes very, very easy and certainly something that Microsoft was going to want you to do. So, so nice uh, to have that as well. WebView 2, we already talked about that. So I'm going to switch over this uh, relatively quickly. But again, important that that's there as an evergreen version now. Uh, a little side note here, single file apps are supported in .NET 6. Uh, that's uh, another thing that you may find very useful for deployment in Windows 11, where you can actually take a .NET app and you have the .exe and you have the .dlls and blah, 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 and actually it packages it into a single file. So we did some examples of that when we looked at uh, the different versions of .NET. So we've done this on various occasions already. Check that out, uh, seda.net.com has all the videos so you can take a look at that, but that's kind of an interesting thing to have there. And now we're getting into some things that are not really Windows 11, but I just wanted to mention them again really quick, MAUI. MAUI is this thing that's coming from the Samarin team. A lot of people say, well, how does that play into everything else? So MAUI is essentially a new version of the Samarin forms package. Xamarin Forms is a package that allows you to build cross-platform apps traditionally for mobile devices, iOS, Android, but they also supported Mac. There's also some support for Windows. Really, the Mac and Windows support was never that big a deal. And then we even lost some of those templates on the way. And it really, most people thought of it as a way to build iOS and Android apps. Well, with MAUI, that's changing. It's becoming more cross-platform. So it's uh, also allowing you to build Windows apps. It's allowing you to build Mac apps and so on. Uh, and build one app that runs on all those platforms. And it abstracts away what it means when you put a button on a form. So when you put a button on a form in iOS, it'll use a Cocoa button. And in, in, 
Windows, it'll use whatever, right? So it, in fact, in Windows, what it uses is WinUI 3. So people say, should I use WinUI 3 or should I use MAUI? Well, you're automatically using WinUI 3 if you're using MAUI and you're targeting Windows. So that's how that works, right? Uh, so that's an interesting thing that's coming. Frankly, I still find it a bit rough. Uh, so I would love to just do a whole thing on MAUI. And, and I had some samples for that in past data.net. But they're still clearly working on it, right? So we'll do that a little bit down the road. But I think it's a, an interesting thing to come. Here's a little more information about that as well. The other thing that's kind of in the, in the same vein is Blazor. Blazor is this web development framework. So Blazor is something that you can do kind of as a, as a next step after ASP.NET MVC. It's a framework that works both on the client as well as on the server. So you can build a server-side app. It's built with .NET code, surfs up HTML. But you can also do this on the client using this new standard called WebAssembly, where you can actually run C-sharp code in the browser, every browser, because it's using web standards. It's not then Microsoft specific. It's just a way to compile C-sharp code to run in the browser on any browser, but using HTML to create the UI. And they have a really nice framework around that. So that's the super short version around Blazor. And we've had several, I think at least two state.nets focusing on Blazor. Go take a look at that. And it's becoming very popular. It's the fastest growing developer technology Microsoft has ever had. And they're extending that to build desktop apps with Blazor. So this is almost the other angle, right? People say, how does that compare to Maui? Well, Maui is building native apps that run everywhere. Blazor is building HTML apps that run everywhere. And the two are converging. So you can say, I want to build a Blazor app, but then get some more native components into it. And, and so it's all merging together. It's a little bit confusing in that sense, but just keep in mind, Maui is the native platform. Blazor is the web platform and, and there's some overlap there. And both of them may be using WinUI 3 under the hood as well as um, Blazor mostly HTML. So that's how that works. And some interesting new stuff in .NET 5 Talked about that more in last week's, last month's data.net. So go back, take a look at that. But the big news is it runs on top of Maui. You can combine those things. Maui runs on top of Windows 11 and you can put all this stuff in the store. And there we go. We now finally have come full circle on this really short uh, overview of what this stuff does. All right. So that's how all of that plays into that big story. And, and all that WinSDK stuff, the project reunion stuff can be used inside of these frameworks as long as you target any kind of version of Windows and MAUI abstracts that away. Okay. And so here's kind of a cheat sheet that I have for you as to when does certain things apply? How do they relate to each other? Um, and again, this is not a Blazor talk, but I just want to put some stuff in here Popularity is very, very high. Again, fastest growing .NET workload that Microsoft has ever put out. Okay, one more quick note here on something that's a little bit nebulous, but clearly important in the future, and that's ARM64. Microsoft has done a lot of work to make sure stuff works on ARM. And people go like, but well, why do I care about ARM? So there's things like, for instance, WPF now runs on top of ARM. And you're like, but I don't have an ARM laptop. How is that important to me? Well, again, that's still a little bit nebulous, but it is clear that ARM is becoming more and more important in, in the industry. So when you look at, for instance, what Apple does, they have just taken their MacBooks off of the Intel x86 platform and onto their own ARM architecture, the chips that they make themselves or at least design themselves. Uh, and so ARM is important for a variety of reasons, like power consumption. And, and so it's clear that Microsoft doesn't want to miss the boat on that. Now, what that will mean, you know, our, our OEMs already out with uh, all kinds of ARM laptops, or are they, are, is everything moving to ARM in the future? We, we don't really know yet, but it, at least Microsoft's working on a lot of support for this. And so I think it's very interesting that they're doing stuff like WPF on top of ARM, and that's why it's uh, important for us in the Windows 11 sense. And here's something that's probably not so interesting for you if you're a business app developer, but just as a side note, game development has been gotten a big push again in Windows 11. So there's things like the game developer, the game development kit, the GDK, which in the past was something that, that was very difficult to get your hands on. If you wanted the GDK and do 
real serious Xbox development, for instance, you needed to apply for this and you needed to have references that vouched for you and all kinds of stuff to get this thing. And that's totally changed now. The GDK is now freely available on GitHub. Everyone can get it. And it just opens up the game development story. There's new technologies that are available like direct storage, like auto HDR. I'm not gonna go into any big detail here because probably not many of us are game developers and I, you know, I'm a hobbyist in it at best. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that all this stuff is available. There's also deployment options in the store have gotten much more friendly. Microsoft doesn't take as big a cut anymore if you're building an Xbox app, for instance. So just a, a little side note that I wanted to mention there. And as a final thought here, uh, Microsoft has put out some interesting videos. There was the big Windows 11 launch event. That's more from a, from a user's point of view. Uh, that's that first URL. If you haven't watched that, go watch that. It's actually very well done and very interesting. And then much harder to find is that what's new for developers in Windows 11. So if you want to look at that and get more info on some of the stuff uh, that I just kind of wrapped up for you in a short presentation here today, go click that link. You can download this slide deck from stata.net.com and it has that link in it or you can write it down right now, I guess. Um, that's interesting because it focuses on developers and they have the individual product groups talk about some of the things they build. So very interesting to watch. So that's some further information for you if you're interested in that. And that pretty much sums up the content part of this presentation. A few more announcements, little things. Uh, Jim already asked you for that at the very beginning. It would really help us if you filled out this survey because it helps us target what we do in the future, what topics are you interested in, what things would you like to hear more about. So you could do me a big favor by filling out that survey. And in fact, we are raffling off an Amazon gift certificate every time. Uh, and we usually, you know, get not thousands of people taking the survey because, you know, you got till Friday. Uh, so pretty good chance of winning that gift certificate too. One more time, we're looking currently very badly for React developers. So if you're a React guy looking for work, Give us a, send us an email, I guess, better than giving us a call. Now, if you are looking at this and you say, wow, that's cool. I wonder how this applies to me. I have this old app. I want to make sure it runs well in Windows 11 or any other thing, right? How does it work in, in Teams? Uh, how do I get it in the store? Or, or even a completely different topic. If you went to this event or you're watching this event, uh, time delayed, recorded, we are extending this offer to you where you can get a free hour of consulting for us so we can chat about that more, right? So get it scheduled. It has been very popular. So it's first come, first serve. Uh, send us an email, info at codemac.com or directly to Jim Duffy and we'll get you in the queue and get that scheduled. There's no strings at tab. We're not going to ask you to give us a credit card number or anything like that. It's just a community thing that we are doing. Real quick about Code Magazine. If you are not a Code Magazine reader yet, uh, get your free magazine subscription. We have a link in here later. In fact, if you're signing up for this event, uh, we extend you a free magazine subscription unless you don't want one. And we have our reader app, uh, which has just become much more important because the Android version will eventually run on Windows 11, right? So get that reader app and then tell your friends we're pretty much giving away, we've, we've made a pledge that we're giving away free subscriptions while the, the pandemic lasts. And since that's still ongoing, we're still doing that. So tell your friends. Um, and if you are a Microsoft customer, if you have uh, a VSS subscription or a Dev Essentials free thing, what used to be called MSDN subscriptions, you can get a full blown print uh, subscription to Code Magazine free of charge. We have a partnership with Microsoft where they basically make that available to you and you can claim it uh, on the Microsoft portal. And we also give away free digital subscriptions. Feel free to share this link with your friends. Uh, if they want to read Code Magazine for free, there is your chance. And finally, Next Stata.net event, as always, last Wednesday of the month in August, we are still debating the topic. There's a few interesting things we have on the horizon, things like Maui, and it's a little bit of a debate on how finished that is and can we really do a full presentation on this. So topic is, is to be announced. Give us your feedback also in the, the survey, what you would like to see, but uh, earmark your calendar, that's definitely coming. 
And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them now. I'm going to hang around for a little bit longer. Uh, if you have questions later, feel free to shoot us an email. I always tell people, consider us a resource. We're not the kind of company that's going to send you an invoice for answering a 10-minute email question. right? So feel free to send us that. Community involvement is, is very important for us, so, so we're trying to be there for you. And with that, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm going to shut down the live stream here in a moment and probably go get some breakfast in the beautiful countryside uh, here in Taos, New Mexico. And hope to see you all next month. Thank you very much.